Welcome, friends. It's wonderful to see some familiar names and to welcome new colleagues. We'll get started here in a minute or two. Look forward to our hour together. Welcome, friends. We're going to get started here in another minute as we are gathering and anticipating, anticipating a wonderful hour together. My name is Paul Yoder. I have the pleasure of hosting today's webinar. And in a moment, I'll invite our three uh, distinguished guests to join me here. I serve as the Director of Graduate Teacher Education in Harrisonburg, Virginia, uh, where Eastern Mennonite University is located. I do want to give a quick shout out and um, explain this great uh, <laughs> new shirt that I'm wearing. Uh, today is Love EMU Day. Um, so if you're connecting with EMU for the first time, or if you've been connected for many years, I invite you to check out um, the EMU website. Uh, lots of activity today and uh, love for you to connect with us. Without further ado, I want to uh, invite our three guests uh, to join me on camera here. And I'm going to very briefly uh, introduce each of them. We were uh, talking before uh, getting started today about how we're in different time zones. Um, we are... Um, involved in all kinds of work. Um, and so trying to summarize uh, for three presenters is really challenging. So I'm going to just very briefly introduce Heather and then Evelyn and then Anita. Um, one way that the three of them have connected over the years is through collaborating on the little book of youth engagement in restorative justice. Uh, which is what uh, we look forward to hearing from you and, and conversing with you about today. Um, so we'll first hear from Heather. Heather Bly Manchester is an educator, trainer, and connector, I love that word, uh, with over 30 years of experience facilitating leadership and community engagement programs and using theater, games, and movement uh, to bring restorative justice to many uh, different settings. And um, after Heather uh, shares, Eveline Aquino is um, going to share as well 
Uh, Eveline is a longtime organizer, educator, trainer, and dancer with over 35 years of experience in being circle with elders, peers, youth leaders, and community. Again, these are just the briefest of introductions. Looking forward to hearing more from each of you. And Anita Vadva will also be sharing with us today. Um, we were, uh, before we came on, we were just talking about the uh, final four and some great women's basketball um, because Anita is a native Houstonian. Um, Anita is descended from Punjabi refugees and owes everything to her parents, husbands, and lo two lovely girls. Uh, she has been in education uh, since 2001 in various roles, from being an English teacher um, to a dean of students and an RJ coordinator. So as we think about what goes into these conversations and how we build connections, um, I want to challenge myself and I invite each of us to be listening for what are these threads um, that each of them have been working with over many years and how they weave this fabric together. So without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Heather and thank each of you for being with us today. Thank you, Paul. And I think Anita is going to get the slideshow up so we can begin. Grand, it's almost there. So, I go back one, please. So, um, Anita, Evelyn, and I have been working in partnership with young people since we were young people and uh, learning from elders since we were younger, I guess the way to put it. And we have all been, had the opportunity to work and grow with young people and elders of different ages uh, throughout our lives in different capacities, whether that be in formal, more formalized settings within the school system or within the nonprofits, you know, supporting schools, right? In different ways. And we came together looking at uh, the work we knew, we've known each other, Evelyn and I have known each other and youth organizing for a long time. And Anita and I met each other through RJ when she brought youth from Houston to Oakland. And so we had an opportunity to come together and circle online and really explore what it meant to write a book, um, Passing the Talking Piece. And what does it mean to embody equity and embody what we're talking about in the book while writing it and push a system or try to hold the mirror to both ourselves and to the publishing system and the writing system um, about what does it mean to really embody equity? What does it mean to work to hold an intergenerational partnerships within a book while writing them? Um, so you'll find out as you learn more about the book that uh, we partnered with young people in our chapters, alumni, people were interviewed um, and continue to uh, facilitate and share about the book with uh, the young people who have just as much ownership of the book. So I think we, we all three of us really wanna um, honor and respect and thank the young people and elders in the communities that, that we work in and come from uh, for supporting and the growth of, of this book. And uh, with that, I'm going to move into intergenerational partnerships. So one of those young people, Itzamar Caramona Felipe, uh, hails from, well, hails from Oakland or went to school in Oakland. And Itzamar is a co-writer in one of the Oakland chapters and helped us uh, develop the leadership, emerging leadership that uh, youth engagement in RJ uh, is growing. And so one thing that we're on, like Itzamar and I were talking, and Itzamar uh, reflected on their work in RJ from both a student and then as a young adult's perspective and working with different ages. And these were the words that became one of our key grounding principles, uh, our key values to, to this book. And so that intergenerational partnerships acknowledge the wisdom in every uh, human being moving beyond just youth and adults um, to include babies, children, teenagers, young adults, elders, and every age group. Everyone has something to offer the collective. And in our journey towards justice and equity in this world, we all have a role no matter our age. And this is a core value 
um, to our work. And if we go to the next uh, slide, we have a scribble uh, that turned into a diagram to share. And a lot of times in youth participation or youth engagement work, folks talk a lot about youth voice and youth adult partnerships and a kind of a binary relationship between two groups of people. And the way we look at it intergenerationally is we are all consistently connected and woven and learning from each other. And so elementary school youth are both teaching and learning with, from middle school youth um, and vice versa. So we're, we're partnering across and by partnering across, we're weaving a stronger fabric um, of community and, and of restorative justice work. So, and that leads us into our next uh, value um, around liberatory education. And so our, our second core value, in order to transform structural injustice, that's the type of liberatory education uh, that, that we are talking about. And you can see this diagram and I believe you can see, I can't on my screen. Anita, can you name the, off the, the draw the artist? Yes, it's Rebecca not... Haslam and Lauren Allen. Right. And Anita uh, knew them and worked with them to share this newer image. So some of you might be really familiar with equality equity. Um, their work took it and pushed it towards liberation. So I'll give folks a second to look at that and um, to notice what you see there. And in this, and in our in our work in youth engagement and restorative justice, it's to, we're working towards liberation in our collective liberation, and and believe that in education, like with Fre with Paulo Freire, and looking at praxis, and that by doing this work on ourselves, consistent ongoing reflection work, um, and where like liberatory education is a practice, a pedagogy where youth and adult young people and adults and all intergenerationally engage in that practice in order to work um, and imagine something new, a different, more just society. And so it's this work on ourselves, it's holding the mirror to the system and doing that ongoing work to shift, to shift education. And we believe that like with youth engagement and restorative justice, that that's part of the work on that journey, which leads us to when we started looking at our, our experience and the experience of the young people that we've worked with um, over the years, uh, we started to well, we started to look at uh, youth engagement and restorative justice, and this is how we define it. And I feel like if I was facilitating in a classroom, I'm like, oh, I'm getting bored of hearing my own voice. Uh, so it's time that I'd have someone else read it. I don't think we can do that on the webinar. Though. So youth engagement and restorative justice, uh, we define it as a meaningful participation of youth who are most impacted by structural injustice as change makers, practitioners in all aspects of restorative justice, including community building, healing, and transforming of self and institutions. So, um, and with that, the next slide. So through our work together, and we look at like, what are all these ways that young people are agents of change? Um, and young people are not, a lot of times in restorative justice, Young people are often referred to as, oh, as circle keepers. And they'll partner with adults in circle, and that's about the level that it happens. And what we see is when we're looking at imagining and pushing towards liberation and shifting a system, what does it look like for young people at all different levels uh, are leading in all, different, in all different spaces? And so we offer um, six different ways or modalities of youth engagement and restorative justice. And so, of course, young people are circle keepers. Um, but then young people as educators and teachers, young people as decision makers on school boards, on decision making bodies, on site councils, um, on culture and climate teams at schools, uh, youth as researchers and evaluators, whether that's researching something from a smaller class-based uh, project to a school and system-wide project where young people design those, those research tools, uh, young people as organizers, and shifting the systems when uh, to in order to to create one more change, which we talk about in the Oakland chapter, and then young people as staff. And whether the staff is a kindergartner or not a kindergartner, maybe a third grader uh, who's supporting a, a healthy culture and climate on a playground, uh, versus a high school student or an alumni that, that's working as staff 
uh, or helping to organize restorative justice across the school district. So those are just examples. And in the book, we introduce those modalities. And then in each of our regions, we share um, different aspects, uh, like so different uh, regions will talk specifically or go into case studies or stories really in each of our regions. And Evelyn's gonna take us into that with some of the tools we offer um, in looking at youth participation and transforming education. And then Anita will dive deeper into to Houston and share some of the amazing stories from uh, young people and, and elders in Houston. So Evelyn. Gracias. In the... So in one, early on in our book, we introduce or remind folks, um, since it's been around for quite a while, Roger Hart's um, ladder of engagement or student involvement, who then um, Adam later, um, Adam Fletcher later um, expanded into specific youth engage, um, youth involvement. Um, and we use this as one of two um, frameworks that we wanted to highlight in the work. Um, so some folks, you know, may be familiar with it, but at the bottom rung of this ladder, and the idea is we want young people. This is, this is the, the one thing, people want young people involved, right? One way or another. So the idea is, um, Let's be a little critical. Let's let's engage in critical analysis of what that look like looks like, especially if our intention is to move toward a solution um, of young people having voice, and young people having agency, and young and sharing power with young people. And I say sharing because it is um, somewhat inherent that the adults are usually the ones that have the automatic power, the privilege of power in schools in particular, but also in community. Um, as a whole in our society. So um, here we're looking at the lot of engagement and at the bottom, um, and you know, this we we laid this out and we broke it down so folks had an understanding of because many people when they start to learn about this, if they haven't, um, if they haven't and they're just being introduced, I was like, but we thought we were engaging young people. So at the bottom is the manipulation. Um, you know, the words feel pretty harsh. Um, and for folks who aren't, aren't, and I always say folks, but um, because it could be anyone, um, not just educators, but when you're working with young people, um, there's a, if, if the analysis hasn't been there in the process of really understanding the amount of power that we carry as adults, um, we're thinking that, oh, just invite them and we'll give them candy. We'll give them, tell them we're ha we'll have pizza for them if they just come um, or extra credit, or maybe even money. Um, and so young people show up to an event or, uh, um, or even participation in, in, in doing work in their schools, what they might call RJ, but it's because an adult told them they had to or coerced them, right? Um, and are the young people really able to talk real? Are they really talking about the issues that are important to them? Or are they just coming, doing it, and out, and then real life happens out there, like the young people. So, and we'll move up to the second one, where it's decoration, where we just invite young people, and they're present, but they're not meaningfully engaged. And the difference between that is that um, they have no power, there's no decision making on their part, and many times it's to the acceptance of the adults of what they talk about and what is done. Um, so they might be asked, but not really, right? They might have pictures on the brochure. We go into it more in more detail. We give an example in the book. I'm just gonna touch on each of these quickly. Tokenism. Um, young people are there, but they're expected to act like adults. They're expected to act accordingly. They can't really show up as young people, um, um, who they are, what's important to them. It's what's been set out you know, by the adults that's acceptable that we're gonna talk about and you're gonna say um, what you think or not think and the young people, again, leave and what we call parking lot, go live their real lives and talk about the real things that are important. Um, and then we move into youth informed or student informed in this case. In the book, we say youth informed, but this is the ladder, Adam Fletcher's ladder, um, where we might ask the young people, what's important to you? Um, but not necessarily go into, and how can we solve that? It's like, that's your problem. Um, we're gonna say what should be done about that. <laughs> um, 
So, but there's no, not much of a decision on the student's part, it's just informed of, this is what we're gonna do. Um, it might influence the final product or what um, policy is being created, but not necessarily um, with the young people's um, true reality um, being reflected. Um, we move into youth consulted, where we're moving up the ladder here, student consulted, where there's a possibility of some meaningful engagement here. Um, adults actively ask for the young people's ideas and their thoughts, um, but the adults still make the decisions um, and, and act accordingly to what adults say is acceptable or not acceptable. Um, and young people are then having to be shaped and move, act accordingly to what the adults say is what's gonna happen. And uh, we move into youth adult, um, student adult equality, as we say, um, where there's a 50-50 split in decision-making and authority, maybe even the workload, um, they're sharing ideas of how to make it happen and the follow through. Um, but there's representation, but not quite as much um, led by young people. So this is, we're moving toward that where there is, what are your ideas, what do you wanna do? Um, and for many programs and many schools, um, when they're becoming conscious of, they have become conscious of youth engagement um, and youth involvement in their work, they're moving toward this. And um, so we move up to student driven and youth, this is what we call youth led also. Um, and at this rung, actions are planned, implemented and evaluated by young people themselves. They're fully accountable to the outcomes. So they decide this is what we're gonna do and the adults play a role of, um, of support to the students, um, not necessarily the bottom line. Um, they're to support skill set or resources um, and, and definitely an advisory and behind the scenes role. When we move toward equity um, here at the top, um, where both, both adult and students and students and adults are, are recognized for their ideas and there's more of a partnership one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but many times they don't, it's not breaking the status quo per se. There's still the power balance of I'm the adult, you're the student, and that's where it, fought, it ends. Although there's equity in moving toward creating a policy, um, there it, it's for in our, we, we were there, but we strive for more and you'll hear what we, what we found was um, missing um, that we add in our framework, but definitely um, the three of us as authors have, have worked and have strived um, and have um, been in the, for as much as possible and definitely reflective of making it work in that way, um, which is why we. Evelyn, you're, um, yeah. You're back, you were muted. Oh, sorry. How much did, where was I? Only a few words. You okay. were... Maybe that was just, you know, time is telling me. So we found limitations. We found limitations in the status quo that was being kept um, and, and what we wanted to include in our, from our own experience and the work in the field was what was missing in the ladder to really bring about systemic change and for young people to have the power to be the change and us adults in partnership where we have the resources or the access, but we're sharing that information. We're young people have the skills and we're working toward together to dismantle the systems of oppression that exist. You can move toward the next. And um, we felt in, our, in, in, in the book that we could not write this book without um, a chapter on adultism, partly because many people, um, when we do our work, whether in schools or in, you know, um, as consultants into schools, that becomes a topic of deep understanding that often does not be, get brought up in schools because adults ultimately across the system hold the power. Um, and so we wanted to bring that and deepen the work when we're talking about really dismantling these systems. Um, adults have the power to do a lot and we believe young people also have power to do a lot. So this is, we wanted to define it and we defined it as the inherent and structural bias of adults against young people, youth. 
like you're so articulate for a middle school student. Where'd you get, where did you learn to run a circle like that? Um, really um, dismissing the inherent power and possibility and capability that young people have that we've seen demonstrated throughout our experience um, in our work with young people um, who, yeah, I'm often a student when I work with young people um, and that's, that's our approach. So we incorporated um, Barbara Love's framework to develop a liberatory consciousness. And we found this very important as a framework to support how we break down where we're trying to go when we talk about liberation. And you'll see we added, we changed, we, we introduced a spiral. I'll show you in a minute. But Barbara Love defines liberatory consciousness as an awareness that enables humans to maintain an awareness of the dynamics of oppression without giving way into the despair and hopelessness about that condition. So it's taking into account within the work that we're doing in particularly um, now we're talking about restorative justice in schools and how it is that we understand the dynamics of oppression exists, but what are we gonna do about it and stay in that hope and possibility. Um, and within the framework, I won't take too long, just that the idea is to take the time and incorporate um, the cycle because there'll be times that we're moving straight into action because we've done the awareness and analysis, but it's a cycle because the idea is come back and it becomes a practice. Um, so awareness being, well, for many times becoming aware of, um, of what the framework, I mean, what the um, issue that we're acknowledging, and in particular, we highlight this process with adultism. Um, but the idea is that you can apply what we're working on to different isms that may come up. Um, and awareness, the way that we talk about awareness is um, developing the capacity to notice, to give attention to our daily lives, our language, our behaviors, and even our thoughts. How are we embodying how we've been socialized within these systems of oppression that exist? And taking into account the social constructions of identity that exist. Not that they are not important, but acknowledging that they're socially constructed identities and how they um, play a, a, a part and a role in all of our lives. And we contextualize this within schools. And the idea is one, once becoming aware, and just to share, we also included questions to support the practice of what kinds of questions at each level, at each um, step of the cycle um, to, to engage in. So real quick, all of this is in the book. I'm just giving you an introduction, but um, the analysis examination of why the world it is, is the way it is and why systems of oppression exist. And then um, moving into the analysis of what is that? Why, oh, sorry, that wasn't the first one, aware, yeah. Awareness is, and then moving into analysis, the analysis aspect is the examination of why the world is like that after becoming aware. And then moving into action, um, where one develops and puts into action strategies that formulate the, the, from the analysis and um, moving into a level of accountability where we really embody and move into praxis and that place of um, reflection um, and how it all plays out. And just to, to close this part here, Barbara Love's cycle provides a framework to deepen our analysis of school, of the school content in which youth engagement occurs and live out restorative principles and the core value of liberatory education. As we work in authentic intergenerational partnerships and restorative justice in the school, we must also model actions that lead to justice and equity. And here I introduce to you the spiral. Um, and so the idea is that we go through the framework and the cycle at each level that we find ourselves in with the encouragement that we can move up or move further along the way into liberation with our, um, once we are moving in, in our actions and accountability um, that we are taking into account the, and the, the power and um, capacity and, and possibilities that young people have in our schools to make them just and equitable and move toward liberation of these systems um, of, of, of oppression that exists, not only in our schools, but in our society. So in the snippet, not the easiest thing to explain. And um, we put a lot of work into um, trying to make it 
explain it in the little book. Um, and please look forward to continuing with us as we um, further develop this with you all um, in the field. But um, I'd like to pass it on to Anita, who will do a phenomenal job of explaining as a case study um, how we work toward that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eveline and Heather. So what I'd like to do is to bring you to Houston as a way to understand this youth engagement spiral about how we're ideally trying to move towards liberation and constantly using that reflective cycle of Barbara Love, which is at the very top, the four steps. So I'm gonna to try to use the chapter that I wrote about Houston to give an explanation of some of the concepts that were just discussed. So I am born and raised in Houston. We're um, land that was originally inhabited by the Takapa Ishak, Akokisa and Sana peoples. I've been in education since 2001. And this is a group of students from my last campus. This is my first group of restorative justice leadership students. So in this case study, we're gonna be focusing on the modality of youth as teachers, youth as restorative justice teachers. The overview of our model is right here. We call it YAM or the youth apprenticeship model. The idea being that the way to learn about circle is Yes, you are trained, but we are consistently apprenticing one another. We are sitting together. We're having transparent facilitation. We're learning. We're asking questions during the process and learning by doing. So when I was hired on this campus for context, it's about 800 students. It's a public charter school that is embedded inside a traditional, comprehensive, larger school that is more punitive. My principal wanted a restorative climate, hired me to be the restorative justice coordinator. And so I created this class as an incubator for the practices. So students apply to be in this class and all we're really looking for is social emotional intelligence and maturity to be able to handle the conversations that we have in that class. And they sit in circle and every Friday they push into a ninth grade class. They themselves are in 10th, 11th and 12th grade and they lead circles. And these are all tier one community building circles for an entire year. And the idea is that to create buy-in on the campus, you've got these elders talking to our ninth graders who they lovingly call their fishies. And through this intergenerational relationship, they're able to apprentice the ninth graders into this process and display how do you model vulnerability how do you ask restorative questions? How do you play games? How do you build relationships with people who are different from you? Then if students wanna move on, we have two tracks. They can either move on and learn how to facilitate circles for harm repair. And then in year three, train other people to do that. Or what we're gonna focus on in this next 12 minutes is the teacher track. So in year two, students can say, hey, I wanna learn how to teach a class like this. And they be, can become a TA, there's four TAs. And after being a TA, learn how to write lesson, learning how to teach other people to facilitate circles, learning how to coach them when they are in their circles, in the ninth grade circles, in the year three, they can apply to be the lead restorative justice teacher. And that year three in this intergenerational model is then coaching the teaching assistants. So that is our youth apprenticeship model. And I wanna show how we moved along the spiral. So originally we started with the idea of the adult leading the youth being consulted. And that was fine, we needed to start somewhere. Uh, but I knew that I didn't want to remain there. I didn't want to be the sage on the stage. I didn't want to be the one to constantly do mindfulness and check in. It wasn't a way to have them internalize the, the learning. And, and also it's not very interesting. And it's not a way for them to learn how to upend power dynamics. So we started more with a traditional type of class. But I knew as we were reflecting that there were times where I was displaying adultism. There were times I could be punitive in circle. There were times I could be punitive if I felt that they were displaying behaviors 
that were not in alignment with the principles of the class. And the way I handled it was in a very adultist top-down way. So we started to think, how can we reframe, reframe the class? And we went through this Barbara Love cycle and we tried to move towards youth adult equality. And that's where we got to what I call leadership 2.0, where we had a teaching assistant. So we had one teaching assistant work with me. The first one was named Angel and they would teach the class. And I was actually removed from circle. I was a Dean of students and I would be on my laptop just observing and they would run circle. They would run mindfulness. They would coach others in doing mindfulness. They would teach lessons about oppression and social justice. And once again, at the end of that year, we had to engage, not at the end of the year, throughout the year, but at the end, as we thought, how can we pivot in my interviews and talks with students, including Angel, the first TA, they said, it was a little scary to teach for lack of a better word, but you've always kind of thrown me into stuff since the beginning. So it's just another day in the life. I could have used a little more support when some days I felt like I didn't know what I was doing and my peers could tell. So that was uncomfortable for me. I think we hadn't fully figured out what the lesson plans were. I remember we had a packet of readings and a binder. It was like a flexible syllabus. So keeping that in mind, I thought that's not good enough, right? You don't want people to be thrown into a situation. They gotta have support so that they can thrive so that everyone can get the best out of the situation. So this is the binder of which Angel was speaking where I said, here's all these resources and here's lessons that I've used in the past. And I didn't just hand it to them and walk away but it was, here's a starting place, okay? And so after that, we decided in Leadership 3.0, we're gonna have four TAs and we're gonna have Leslie, who, who was a TA, become the lead restorative justice teacher. And Leslie is gonna coach these TAs on really how to teach. And, and it was completely student run, okay? And I really, really took a back seat. Now I was coaching Leslie, along the way. So I want to show you an example of the sessions they would have once a week where Leslie had kind of crafted out the agenda, the objective, and was talking to the other TAs about teaching the little book of restorative justice. Give me a thumbs up, Heather and Evelyn, if you can hear it okay. Okay, um, so I thought this would be a good idea to It says when things are out of balance, fear and security results to community needs, needs to restoration of peace, security, and pre preventative measures of the future. So I feel like that's a really good um, kind of like definition. And then it tells you like two ways of how it compares to criminal justice uh, versus restorative justice, which is what we're doing. So it kind of gives them a sense of like what we're doing, how is it different than what it would be in real life. Um, if you look at it in the criminal justice, and then it gives you the three different questions. Um, so for restorative justice, it would be who has been hurt, who are who are their needs, and then whose obligations are these. While in the criminal justice is what laws have they have been broken, who did it, and what did they deserve. So, the so that's just a little snippet to give you a flavor of the meetings they would have at lunch once a week of a coaching session. And definitely Leslie had to be coached um, along the way. I mean, these are teenagers. These aren't people who've gone through a teacher training program. And as you can already tell, they were phenomenal. But Leslie told me, you would often just say you need to apprentice the TAs. They're not like you. Meaning Leslie is a very organized, when she sees it, it is, comes like this. And so she would expect the same from her TAs. She would think I explained it so clearly and then the lesson just would fall apart. So I had to coach her on the competences you need on how to coach your TAs. You can't just give them feedback and leave it there. You have to provide some options. And if those don't work, maybe you need to speak again and find what does work. That seemed to work well and then the pandemic hit. So completely youth driven seemed great. But again, I was actually physically present. And as the year passed on, I realized, okay, I'm going to really be more intentional with coaching Leslie. 
when the pandemic happened, I was virtual, everyone was virtual, but I was half time. My, my position was cut. I wasn't doing circles at home and I was teaching another content. So I was completely removed from the situation. So imagine teaching a circles restorative justice class online as a teenager to your peers during a global pandemic and then pushing into ninth grade classes through a computer screen to lead circles with ninth graders who have never sat in a circle. So Beatriz was the restorative justice teacher during the pandemic and the feedback I got and Leslie had been her restorative justice teacher when she was a TA. So that was the intergenerational passing on of the knowledge. When she was a teacher, she said, when learning from Leslie, I would get some advice and ways to improve myself. Now as an RJ teacher in the pandemic, I don't have someone else to tell me what I can improve upon. So the lesson there is sometimes we think it's so great to let young people just run the show. And this has to be intergenerational. As elders, we have something to offer as well. We have to be aware of our adultism, but not to the point where we completely disappear and forget that we have things to share and things that we can, We yes, we're learning from them, but we are learning from each other. So these are just some tips that are in the book about what are some things when you are working with young people who are being RJ teachers, who are then apprenticing teaching assistants. Um, the main thing that I wanna emphasize is that if done well, if you really make it intergenerational, if you move towards that equity where yes, we're equal, but you know what? We got to really watch out for our young people. Are they in counseling or are they eating right or are they sleeping? And when it's too stressful, maybe they can't teach. Maybe that's too much pressure. And that's maybe when the adult steps in and says, you take a break. I'm going to lead. I'm going to coach the TAs this week. So making sure that we're being aware of when we need to step up and when we need to step back, I think is the biggest lesson from here. And as a postscript to this, I wanted to share something that I thought would be a beautiful way, a beautiful note to end on because I am now at a different campus. I'm an assistant principal in 10th grade at a Catholic school for students who traditionally wouldn't be able to afford private school and it's subsidized by them doing corporate work study one day a week. So we don't have restorative justice and I'm people are open to it, but I thought I'm an assistant principal, I'm not teaching, we don't have a class. How do we do this? And I invited Esmeralda Rocha, who's in the pointing at the screen in there, and we um, manipulated and tokenized young people to come uh, with pizza. And then eventually the people who wanted to stay, they didn't get pizza and they show up every week now. So that was a joke, we didn't manipulate. But we said, there's this new strange thing, it's called circle, try it. And Esmeralda came and we had a teacher leave and she now teaches sophomore college readiness. So my former restorative justice teacher, trainer who I've consulted with is now my colleague, is now teaching so this is a picture of her in her first day of teaching. She started mid year. She's only been teaching for two months. And now I kind of want to zoom back out and show you what she did on her first day of teaching, which is circle. This right here is an act of liberation on this campus. The pedagogy is quite traditional. We have wonderful teachers, but it's, it's traditional, right? There's a lot of rows staring ahead and there's some grouping, but Esmeralda is really infusing the principles of liberation, of intergenerational partnerships, of honoring everyone's talents, their voices in her classroom. And whenever I'm feeling a little stifled or uncertain of why am I, you know, what am I doing here? How can I increase student voice? I walk into her classroom and she's thriving. She's the favorite teacher of a lot of students and she's on point. It's not just that she's a young and hip teacher. No, she's on point. She's authoritative and she invites voice. And to me, this is just the best example of why Heather, Evelina, and I do this work because it's just the continual passing on 
of the gifts that we have received and to continue to learn from each other. So I am going to stop here and welcome any questions and pass it back to Paul. Thank you so much, Heather, Evelyn, and Anita. I did put a, an invitation. Um, that was one of the notes I just took about inviting voice. So there's an open invitation um, in the chat and I'll verbalize it now uh, for our audience, our attendees. Feel free to use the Q and A um, for questions and I'll kick us off. I wanted to um, follow up on this adultism uh, notion and I encountered a similar um, critique, which was definitely not uh, framed in terms of liberation, um, but this concern about referring to students as future something, like future citizens or future uh, voters or future workers. Um, I think the future citizen is probably the most um, common explicit um, title, but some of these other notions are very much implied, if not made explicit in, in certain contexts. So I would wanted to invite you to um, say a little bit more about how some of these messages are encoded in the different contexts or literature that uh, you're familiar with. And I, I don't know who to call on, so I'll have to uh, let you okay, all we can just <laughs> chime in. And yeah, I, I was just going to say, I just think anyone who does restorative justice is aware of how important language is. And I haven't thought about that before, actually, Paul. So I appreciate the future this, the future that, future scholars is the big one. Um, although a lot of people call students scholars. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's very important to be aware of. And then another thing that is very normalized in schools is low, medium and high students. And I have a friend, Trey, who is a cultural critic and also hilarious and said, can we stop referring to kids as hair dryer settings? And yeah, let's not do that, because if we did it to adults, how infantilized would they feel like that's a low teacher? That's a medium one. So yeah, I really, I just appreciate your comment. I see Heather has something also. Well, I was gonna add two quick things to think on. One is, um, I, I think I hear future leaders the most and definitely within adultism, you hear that. And I think, I mean, young people were, have been organizing around restorative justice in Oakland and that's in the chapter. And after tons of organizing using full board, um, city council, et cetera, they also got tired of, a, like, they don't have a vote. They have an advisory vote of the two student directors on the school board, as in many school boards, that's the case. And so they were like, okay, we're not getting, we're not being heard. And so we're going to organize intergenerationally for 16 year olds to vote for school board. And so that's major coalition organizing and um, that passed. And so we should see in the next year in Oakland, 16 year olds be able to vote for school board. And so that's also like, so, I mean, that's a prime example of, here's the example, why are we, why are we using the word this way? Um, but it's, I also like, citizen also becomes a very loaded word. So that's also another thing about how can we separate or like, I don't know, that just becomes, a very a little word, but the last thing I was going to say is I hear the most in RJ is tier one, tier two, tier three students. Like that's within you know multi-tiered levels of support. And thinking about, and it's one of the reasons why some of the, the conversation we've been pushing to talk about relate like re relationship, restore and repair, or re repair and restore. Like how do we transform from this tier one, tier two, tier three? And, and as an educator, am I a tier one educator? Am I a tier two educator? my tier three, like, dude, I, I need tier three interventions in my life sometimes, right, as a human, um, but like, or I need to be held in circle or whatnot. So I just think, sometimes I think we need to like, it's it's because it's young people becoming subjects 
as, as opposed to partners too. So Evelyn, I don't know if you wanna add anything. I was just gonna say that um, many of our experiences have also, like Heather spoke of the young people coming up with the idea of creating a, diff a completely different board. Um, my, my background in youth development and extensive organizing is being with them and hearing the solutions and uh, the, the deep thought process that they're often not invited to um, contribute and add to what adults are thinking as the solutions for whatever issues are happening or even the perspective and analysis of the reality that young people are living. So when you, when with those coded words of tier one, tier two or high, low or um, future, there's a disregard to the power, inherent power that they have within and their capacity to decide now, make happen now, um, articulate now what needs to happen and how we, um, how we move forward together in a solution oriented way. And the other thing that is often the case is looking at the problem or whatever issue we're talking about or schools are, are dealing with is one, looking at them always as problems, right? Um, and two, um, as that adults are the only ones that can fix it. Um, and so with those kind of, those languages and those words and even the connotation sometimes when it gets changed, <laughs> like, you know, they might change the words, but the connotation is still the same, is that um, the, the bringing it out. And that's where that awareness, um, Paul, that you spoke of, starting at awareness, analyzing what is that, what falls into that, and then moving into an action that is holding us accountable to that. So when we talk about our framework, that's an excellent example of going through the process of being like, oh, and then seeing how that, what you became aware of um, is falling into your work with young people and where does that, what's the possibility that lies beyond that? So um, there's definitely um, a need and, and our experiences have definitely, and, and young people tell us, creating that level of respect for young people to tell us um, of where we're falling short of that. So um, th when that analysis happened, I once had a, um, was a supervisor to some students and I always say my staff, this was, 30 years ago, 20 something years ago, 20 something years ago. And my student, uh, a young college student who was a peer leader said to me, um, you know, I would really appreciate it if you wouldn't call me my, wouldn't say my staff, we're colleagues, you know, um, you just have a different position. I said, say we're, I was already creating that, but my language when I'm speaking with other people, that's, and it's just habitual um, because the way I was working with them was definitely building um, the, the capacity and the engaging um, and inviting agency, but I really appreciated that and, and creating that level of respect um, for that to for us to engage in um, is also super invited when we're working at that level of a partnership. Thank you so much. So I I'm you know needing to respond or uh, needing to deal with the fact that once I hold the mirror up. Um, I literally today in writing referred to future leaders uh, when talking about the college students that I work with. Um, so that was <laughs> that's an exact phrase that Heather used as like another example of what I um, appreciated you all pointing out. Um, and Evelyn, I remember some really some of the first conversations that I um, was really learning very actively through was PhD students who were uh, pushing back against um, faculty who were saying like, this is my student or this is my, P this is my doc student. Um, even when it was meant to be a positive, like we're in relationship, but yeah, that ownership language was something that um, was very much, as you said, indicative of the type of relationship that was, um, in fact, in place, and therefore was an important marker. Well, thank you all for um, chiming in with some questions. So we'll um, probably need to think about if we can get one response to um, a couple of questions that have chimed in um, as we come towards approach the end of our hour. Um, so Kathy Evans had... Um, asked a question. I'll go ahead and read it. Anita, I see that you've already, um, uh, that you're aware of it, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it and then uh, invite one of you to chime in. 
Can you talk a bit more about some of the institutional challenges? I'm sure there are many, so we'll just have to think about a few um, most important ones that you've overcome as you uh, move up the ladder that um, you described. How have you worked to get administration on board for this level of intergenerational leadership? Anita, did you want to answer? Uh, yeah. I feel like I had an answer, but I don't know if it's appropriate. Sometimes the best way to get buy-in for authentic restorative justice is to lean on the fact that intergenerational partnerships can be quaint and cute and um, can make you look good. It's good optics, I guess you could say. And so, and this is not the campus I'm at right now, I'm thinking something else, but the campus I'm at now, they're actually just open to it and there's a need for healing and connection. But I, I do think sometimes there's still a lack of really understanding what restorative, what the real work behind restorative justice, what the adults have to model and how we have to be vulnerable and how we have to model like really empathetic, compassionate communication. So I think right now restorative justice is a great buzzword and it's best to take advantage of it um, in spaces where people are trying to look good. Is that a bad way to put it? And then just go in and do it. And then I think when they see it in action, then then you're you're caught in as as I mean, once you see it in action and it's done well, then I think you can get true authentic buy in. Uh, Anita, I also wanted to share that many times those of us that have been working in this are invited to speak or or to teach a training or something. I was working at a high school and I was invited to do a PD session. Um, myself and the other person that was teaching the, the leadership, the RJ class. And we took it upon ourselves to facilitate that the young people would be the major players in that training. So it was working with uh, doing a PD, but the young people were the facilitators of the session. And the teachers in that building were blown away, partly because they've never seen young people at the lead or being the teachers. So like Anita said, just doing it and then in, in that model be like, wow, they, they were blown away of the capacity, but it was a time and effort and support and young people, other students to really be prepared and do it but not that they couldn't do it, um, but given the right structure and support um, and, and speaking from their heart, from their own experiences many times in a class like an RJ class. So when it comes to getting folks on board, um, Kathy, you, you asked is really um, giving opportunities for the young people to demonstrate their leadership, whether it's we're having a conversation about young people, well, young people should be here to, to be able to, to speak for themselves. Um, and yeah, and then really, and also when we talk about the work, uh, a lot of what I like to do when I do, um, when I go into schools is to have the teachers sit and feel and acknowledge their own humanity. And in, which is very, very different than just coming in with a PowerPoint and here are the points for your mind and removing the heart and spirit and body from the experience of the work. So also, um, really having the experiential experience of what that is. As you wouldn't believe how many times just asking who you were when you were the age of your students is a humongous revolutionary question. So really um, bringing it to that level is often um, incredibly powerful for um, adults and administration and teachers to see like, whoa, I didn't even think of that. Um, so. In relation um, to the latter, to add is that, oh, am I muted? No, you are, Ed. <laughs> came up on my screen. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, in moving, I think there's two things with the latter is that if, as Evelyn says, if young people are advocating or telling what they, their story or what they would like, that's going to be heard way more than any adult ever speaking. Because young people make up the majority of our students, the people in our schools. And so when young people are advocating, or young people are speaking or holding, they're gonna be heard more than adults are. If also there's strategy behind it too, right? 
So what does it mean to be staff that supports, like any political person has staff that does a bunch of work to support that person to bring their best self to that space. So what is, what's this, like, what's the role? What's that 50-50 on the ladder, that equity piece there? Or 40, or is, is it 40, 60, depending on what it is at that moment. And I, I think about like Lynn Lee um, from Oakland started as an RJ, uh, as a young person, as a youth RJ leader in sixth and seventh grade, and now as a student director on the school board. And so what we've also seen is young people who started holding space and shifting culture in their schools in RJ, and then have started to expand how they're leading in all these different spaces. And so what I see is, I mean, she talks about like how in the book, she'll talk about how circle, like if you are in circle with those in positions of power, you get to know them and be in relationship with. When you stick out a circle, they have more power than you do in certain places. But as a young person, they also have power that the mayor doesn't have, right? So what does that mean? How does circle support building relationship with if we're trying to build a better, you know, a more equitable society, both in and out of school, because we don't just exist in our schools. And so I think, and the ladder, I mean, we're not, we never stay on one rung of a ladder. We talk about this in the book and we joke about, because I grew up like picking apples and working on farms. And so like you move up and down a ladder to like harvest an apple tree, right? You don't just stand on one rung. You have to move up and down at different times on the different spaces. And um, that needs to happen. But one of the things that we really, that you know, Evelyn was mentioning earlier is the ladder doesn't have enough deep praxis of like, there's no racial justice lens. And if we're not talking about that in schools, that's, that's a problem. Like that's work we have, I, I, we have to be doing, I feel, we, have, we feel. And so like, I think that's also like, the, that's, where, that's where we're playing with this spiral. We're offering this spiral as a new place um, to start. So yeah. So the, the next question is about specifically in a K-5 setting. How do you think the spiral could be adapted or how has it been um, implemented in that setting um, as an, uh, the question asker uh, references what uh, some of the storytelling Anita was sharing about the maturity level or the um, developmental level of the students as well. So yeah, specifically in that elementary, um, I think one of the one of the phrases I wrote down is, what does it look like to step up and to step back with students who are maybe six years old or 10 years old? The example in the book about the spiral, isn't it, Anita, is it, it's, it's in elementary school. You can refresh my memory. All I know is I, sometimes I wish I, I would love to be in an elementary school because I have two elementary age daughters who are very, um, they do circles on her campus. And I think you can work towards liberation with elementary school students. It's just going to look different. I don't know that I'm the best person to speak to it as I'm not an educator of elementary school students, but I am the mother of elementary school students. And I think everything's gonna look different. I've talked about when you're doing circles, a common checking question is, how are you doing from one to 10? Well, if you're in kindergarten, that's not gonna translate. Well, what do you mean? 10 being the West. The, so, you know, it's like, do you use emojis? Do you do thumbs up? Do you do thumbs down? Do you do thumbs? And everything can be modified to what that would look like. And then some things wouldn't be developmentally appropriate. You wouldn't have a, a very, very young child necessarily medi mediating a, a more serious conflict, but just as on the playground, you have your peacekeepers, right? Um, that kind of have their, refer to that a little bit, not official peacekeepers, but like my daughter Naya is just one of those people who, you know, I guess being around restorative justice world, she has the soft skills that it takes to, to help. And, and I think that's something that students can learn. That's a skill set they can learn. And I think that her elementary school is teaching her some of those things as well. So that is a vague question. That's just, just me saying it can happen. And I, I would never want to compare elementary and high or expect the same thing. I, I just think it can happen. It looks different. And I think it's 
exciting. What an exciting place it is um, to be able to start to bring that in. I think what a what a difference, what an impact you make at that age, so that when they come to us in high school, they're already equipped with some of these skills. I think it also has to do with value too, the acknowledgement of the amount of power that the teacher has. And um, as I as I spoke at the different rungs of the ladder that we incorporated into the spiral is acknowledging when it, when is it what the teacher says or when is it what the students are thinking and, and what's possible or what a possible solution or which direction. So it's always that acknowledgement of the amount of power and, and whose voice and whose decisions are being um, articulated or highlighted or made priority. So you know you can create a structure within a classroom of acknowledging that it's not always going to be what the adult wants to do or what the adult wants to say and allowing the young people to speak or the students to speak their truth. And it's really about creating a space where it's held, where it's acknowledged, where it's recognized and where it's respected. So that when I when I think of, I don't only think of conflict, I think of, you know, what should we do on Friday or what's possible or, you know, something happened in our classroom. What should we do about this? And the students will be the first to tell you, we need another recess because we have a lot of energy, right? So it's about the acknowledgement and I'm not, and, and that's not to be taken for granted because we have really moved from a natural state of being into this, what we created, we want little robots in the classroom. These are children that are human beings, not human doings that need to be in nature, that need to play, that need to feel. And so creating that space for young people to be heard and to share many times, we will be moving in the, a direction that is healthier because once they start to acknowledge versus disconnect from what they need and feel, we can work together to having a healthy classroom, healthy schools, and, and definitely a healthy society. Um, and learning the skills of how to articulate and how to, you know, how to even, they continue to acknowledge who they are, what they need, build empathy with each other, and really sort of have space to be, so. As you all are painting this beautiful picture, I keep coming back to the, concrete illustration of the liberation versus the equality and the equity and and the the role of all of the community members in dismantling right and so you're illustrating that um, in really important ways so we are in extra time um, so we'll go to one final question and then need to wrap up um, so evan asked about what this intergenerational rj as compared to a more traditional leadership program or class, um, how do you see those two entities um, as being similar or uh, different from each other? I know the idea of a leadership program or a leadership class is, is probably more, um, some of us have more experience than others, but what do you um, see as the, the differences or the similarities? Well, I think whether it's peer RG, and a peer RG class or whether it's a, a leadership class, I think the praxis of the like doing the work, the liberatory work of like, who am I partnering with? Who am I most comfortable partnering with because of who I am or which students I easily connect with? And what's the work I need to do on myself to make sure that I am connecting and partnering and inviting other young people like to the space? Who are the young people that are invited to the space? Whether it's peer RJ, whether it's a leadership class, whether it's any way we're engaging in partnership with young people. I think that's the, one of the biggest things because a lot of times folks will tell us like, oh, we want those students because they follow the rules or follow directions or, you know, like young people engage all the time. It just may be inconvenient for us. So I think like the question is, who, who are we partnering with and where are we just doing the reflection on ourselves of like, oh, I noticed that I really connect with, you know, girl, middle school girls that remind me of like what, what I was like in middle school or, you know, okay, that's great. Now what else is the work I have to do? So I'm just, I guess, I guess I first offer that with any type of class. And then 
RJ integrates really nicely into leadership classes as part of, like Circle is part of our leadership, our middle school leadership curriculum in Oakland, Integrate Circle. Whether you're a peer RJ leader or whether you're doing other leadership and, and youth engagement and organizing, right? So that's, I guess that's the first thing, but like every schools have different models. And if I could just add definitely that the idea of leadership is that we are acknowledging that we are not making future leaders to follow the script of what a leader is in our minds of how we've been socialized and creating space and acknowledging the inequities that exist in much of our systems of leadership, whether it be the teachers don't look like the students, the principals and superintendents don't look like the student population to you know local government right so when we talk about leadership is also having a critical analysis and incorporating that framework of liberatory consciousness into who a leader is and who's leading who and leading to where and hopefully that the center foundation be toward liberation of dismantling the systems of oppression so i think we say liberation and some people are free from what from those systems that don't allow us to feel free within our bodies, with each other, um, and, and really honoring our humanity. So it's, um, I think that foundation is where um, traditional leadership programs have, you know, often fall, fallen short of who gets to be a leader and what does that look like? And chapter nine in the book introduces a different way of looking at leadership that young people in doing the working on the book and interviewing and partnering with the young people across our regions. Um, as we were, well, as Itamar was looking at a lot of the, the research, we we're realizing that we're, people were saying they're, they were shifting in how they led. And so chapter nine is an opportunity for folks to get the book and read chapter nine because it's probably one of the quickest reads in the book, but it really offers across regions how, how youth engagement and restorative justice is shifting leadership and moving from like the star to the constellation, which is what I think some of the stuff talked about there. Thank you so much, Heather. Yeah, again, providing another um, visual for us, the from the star to the constellation. And um, what I wanted to just um, echo from what I was hearing you say, Evelyn, was this um, idea of going towards liberation instead of replication, right? To say, can we empower, can we follow rather than simply saying here's the system whoever is willing to stand up and perpetuate this system is who gets the power right because that's how systems usually operate which is where liberation is revolutionary all right we do need to end here um i want to echo um charlie and um uh, say just thank you so much um for your work, which is only briefly summarized in one hour. Um, so many references to the book, um, also an invitation to uh, in the chat here, and we'll uh, include in our follow-up email uh, the information that you put here, uh, Anita. So thank you for that. In terms of EMU um, stuff, we have uh, webinars. We have RJE conference in June. It's also online, so it is accessible. If you're able to watch this, <laughs> um, you can join us for the conference. Um, as well, um, we're wanting to recognize the investment of time that audience members have made and wanting to um, make professional learning uh, documentation available for your time investment. So feel free to reach out to my colleague Cara um, and her emails there. So thank you very much for leading us um, during this time and in this aspect of the restorative justice work as we seek liberation in partnership, authentic partnership with the many members of our communities. Go in peace. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.